Yeah. But do you think people can hear me in the back? Yes, if I, I speak, believe. Yeah? I believe so. Yes. So I would prefer without, if it is okay. Without, okay. Is it okay? You can no, use yeah. the volume. Yeah, perfect. And without, okay. Wonderful. If, if they can't hear me, then I can use the PowerPoint prezentacije. Dobrodošli na predanje naše uvažene koleginice, profesora Barbara Hole, sa pravnog fakulteta Univerziteta u Amsterdam. Evo jedna možda stvar koja je možda zanimljiva za nas istok u Evropi. Profesorica Hole je poreklom iz Češke republike. Uspela je kao jedna od najboljih studenta koja je bila u Holandiji da ostane čak i tamo da postane profesor. Eto, to je jedan od okaza između ostaloga da ne mi sa istok u Evropi nismo tako loši kada u jednoj zaista razvijenoj zemlji zapadne Evrope sa daleko dužom tradicijama obrazovanja neko je to koje je poreklom slično kao i mi je uspeli da se probije i da dođe do toga da čak eto bude profesor na pravnom fakultetu u Holandiji i to u glavnom gradu u Amsterdam. Razlog zašto smo pozvali profesoricu Holu ovde jeste taj što se ona bavi slične stvarima onima koji se bavim ja i vaš mladi kolega Stefan Radučić, a to je međunarodnim krivičnim pravom. Ta oblast eto i mene interesuje, njoj interesuje, tako smo se i upoznali pre dve godine na jednom skupu u Holandiji gde sam imao čas da me profesorica Holu pozove, gde sam bio jedan rad izložio u vezi sa odmeravanjem kazne u srpskom krivišnom pravu suđu, upravo u slučajevima suđenja za ratne zločine. Tada smo se i upoznali, eto tako, da kažemo, uspostavili ovu saradnju, eto nakon godinu i pođe skoro, pa da, malo manje od dve godine, eto ja sam pozvao kolegenicu Polu ovde, da i vi upoznate, da vama održi jedno predavanje i tako da praktično sam stvorio mogućnost, eto i da i vi dođete, da kažem, do nekih svežijih, novih seznanja, od ljudi koji se s ovim istim stvarima bave, a opet stručnima, iz drugih uglova posmatraju ove stvari koji na drugi način, da kažem, doživljavaju međunarodnom krivišnom pravu, zato što će danas biti u stvari i temeljene predavanja, perspektive i težnje međunarodnom krivišnom pravu. Sviđa, vi znate da međunarodnom krivišnom pravu u najvećem broju slučajeva se poisto većuje sa međunarodnom krivišnom pravu. To je prirodno i normalno. Ako nema presuda u međunarodnom krivišnom pravu, je li tako, a institucije međunarodnom krivišnom pravu sviđa donose te presude, gde je onda međunarodnom krivišnom pravu? Nema ga nigde, je li tako? U unutrašnjim pravnim sistemima ta pitanja niko ne postavlja, zato što pravosudne unutrašnje sisteme, sudove, nikad ne dovodimo u pitanje. Svaka država ima sudove, je li? Međutim, međunarodno krivišno pravo nije tako. Neophodna je saglasnost više država potpisivanja međunarodnih ugovora u kojim se formiraju sudovi i ti sudovi da sudi. Upravo zahvaljujući tome, ovakva predavanja, kao na koje ćete danas čuti od profesorice Hole, imaju, znači, da kažem, svoje razloge, imaju, da kažem, kako bih rekao sada, prostora i u ovoj našoj oblasti mogu i jesu interesanti. Vi ćete danas znači čuti o tome kako, eto, profesorica Hola doživljava i smatra da težnje, aspiracije i budućnost međunarodnog krivišnog pravosuđa trebaju da izgleda. Ja neću više dužiti, ne ste već dovoljno slušali ovako i tokom godine, a sada dajem priliku profesorici Holi da vam se obrati. Izvolite. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor Destibojevic and Stefan, for having me. I'm very, very honored to, to, to come here and uh, being able to talk to you about international criminal justice. I came yesterday and uh, I got to walk a little bit around Novi Sad and I really, really like it here. You have a really beautiful town. So I'm very happy to be here. And what I'm going to do, unfortunately, I did not understand what the introduction was. I'm sorry, my Serbian is not very, very good. Despite being Czech, I just get like bits and pieces of words. But uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk to you about international criminal justice after 25 years, 25 years down the road, and uh, its aspirations and uh, realities. And um, uh, basically, I'm a lawyer. I am international criminal lawyer. I worked uh, at the ICTY as well back in the past. Uh, I was working at the defense team of Radovan Karadzic. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the name. And, uh, but next to the practice, I'm actually teaching uh, at the University of Amsterdam, where we have a special master program, International Crimes, Conflict and Criminology. So if, you, if any of you is interested in looking at international crimes and mass atrocity crimes from interdisciplinary perspective, 
come to me, we can talk, send me an email, and uh, I can uh, let you know a little bit more about the program. Can I have the... Yes, yes, we're just trying to... Uh. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, what I'm going to do now, because uh, I asked Stefan when I, when I was preparing this lecture how much you are familiar with international criminal law and international criminal justice, and he told me that some of you actually followed course on international criminal law. So what I'm going to do is not to give you legal perspective. I'm not going to talk legalese or lawyerly but uh, I'm going to give you criminological perspective. So uh, basically looking at uh, empirical realities of international criminal justice. But before I start, I will start with a story. Does anyone know this man? Do you know who that might be? Kaiser yes, yes, and who was Kaiser Wilhelm? Uh, the German emperor during the First World War. Okay, and can you maybe uh, sort of think why, why I put his picture here? when I talk about international criminal justice? Because uh, they thought he's responsible for the, the First World War. Exactly. So uh, this is, this is uh, German Emperor Wilhelm II, who uh, was the uh, Emperor of Germany before the First World War. And uh, he basically uh, initiated, initiated the war. And the First World War is one of the conflicts where uh, Actually, I think that the most casualties on the European soil were, were, were committed during, dur during, during the conflict. And there were millions of casualties and extreme brutalities. And Germany was defeated during the war. And in 1919, Treaty of Versailles was concluded. And Article 227 expressly provided for the prosecution of Wilhelm for a supreme offense against international morality and the sanctity of treaties. However, what happened was that Emperor was never prosecuted, actually. He ended up in the Netherlands, where he was provided with exile. This is the castle, which is 15 kilometers away from where I live now, in Dorn. And he was provided with exile uh, by a Dutch queen, who was his distant cousin back in the time. And he spent his life actually hanging out in the gardens of the castle because he was not allowed to go 15 miles radius away. And he was actually uh, called by some people as a um, woodchopper of Dorn. So he died in peace with no prosecution whatsoever. What about this man? Does anyone know this man? This one is tougher, I think. This is Charles Taylor. Charles, Charles Taylor was the president of Liberia. And uh, approximately 100 years later, compared to uh, the Emperor Willem, he was convicted of 11 counts of war crimes, slavery, rape, recruiting child soldiers, and aiding and abetting one of the rebel group in Sierra Leone during the civil war there. Which, was, which took place for 10 years in 1991 till 2002, and in which some 50,000 people died. He received 50 year sentence and ended in Great Britain in Franklin prison with normal, ordinary criminals. So what connects these two men? You would say that there is, they have nothing in common. But I would say that actually their stories are quite similar. So both are he head of state, or were head of state, which either launched or assisted wars in their neighboring countries, which resulted in many civilian casualties and atrocity crimes. Taylor led a revolution in Liberia and supported rebels in Sierra Leone. They committed many atrocities. Taylor was also initially offered asylum and actually spent some time in Nigeria, but was ultimately arrested, tried, and convicted. So unfortunately for Taylor, I think, he was born what some call age of accountability. Basically, since the 1990s, I think, there is a movement mainly promoted by human rights defenders and human rights NGOs, which attempts to hold even the most powerful individuals accountable for atrocity crimes. I think what these two stories demonstrate is that the times have changed. In the 1990s, after the fall of Berlin Wall, 
human rights movements actually uh, advocated and managed to cause the revival of international criminal justice. Basically, the mantra of international criminal justice is to speak justice to power and hold those, even the most powerful leaders, accountable for mass atrocity crimes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you an overview of this modern phenomenon of international criminal justice. As I said, what I will do, I will summarize mainly empirical studies, so basically scholars stemming from criminology and social sciences, which look at impacts and effects of international criminal courts and tribunals. And the picture that I'm going to paint, I think, is quite sobering. Maybe not so much for you here, but uh, to many advocates and promoters of international criminal justice, basically the difficult realities in which these tribunals operate oftentimes uh, uh, come with disappointment. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about what is special about international criminal justice. Is there something special when we compare it to our domestic uh, uh, criminal justice systems? Then I will sketch very briefly history and presence of international criminal justice because there have been many tribunals which are often times not so much talked about. Uh, then I will talk about the noble aspirations of the system and sobering realities touch upon the accomplishments and challenges of international criminal justice, and then we can maybe together discuss, or I, I will leave you with a big question mark of what the future of international criminal justice is. So is international criminal justice sui generis, as we lawyers would say? And I think that actually it is special, and the special character of international criminal justice has to do with the phenomenon it addresses. These are international crimes, their perpetrators and victims. So maybe I will, I will sort of wake you up a little bit with a uh, discussion. So do you think that international crimes are different from normal crimes, ordinary crimes such as murder or rape, which is committed in domestic states? What do you think? Sorry? Huh? No? Who, who thinks that international crimes are the same as, as domestic ordinary crimes? Raise your, raise your hand. No one. So we think that they are different. Good. And why do you think they are different then? Huh? Maybe because they operate on a bigger scale. Exactly. That's, that's part of it, certainly. They are committed on a bigger scale. Anything else? Yeah? With, of course, bigger consequences. What do you mean by bigger consequences? Uh, for international safety. Yeah, exactly. So cooperation of states. Yeah, so that they threaten international security, right? They are qualified as offenses against international peace as well. And there was one more hand in the back, yeah? There is not uh, just one body which will prosecute the offenders, and it has, there has to be a consent, consensus between the states which will prosecute them. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there is no international, no single international court which would prosecute all offenders of international crimes. So these are some of the characteristics, and of course, I don't have to go here into details what international crimes are: genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression, crime against peace. And they are legally different, legally different because each of them requires specific contextual element. So they all can be committed by violent acts, which are very similar to our normal domestic offenses. But what distinguishes them are the contextual element. So for genocide, the perpetrator has to act with the specific purpose to destroy a specific group. For crimes against humanity, there has to be a widespread and systematic attack against civilian population. For war crimes, uh, we need to have an uh, armed conflict. But what is also specific about these crimes, and you mentioned it very, very correctly, is that they are committed within a specific political and societal context. So oftentimes, they are committed by authoritarian states during wars or social uprisings. So there is always some social movement, something bigger going on when these acts are committed. And as you said, they are large scale, they are often systematic, which means that they are planned, committed by groups against groups. 
therefore collective violence, and they are oftentimes state-sanctioned or tolerated, which means, if you think about it, that the state role is actually put upside down. So state does not repress criminality, but oftentimes it condones or even promotes crimes. So the state actually acts in some instances as a perpetrator, which if you think about it actually puts our thinking about criminality upside down. And this is also related to the perpetrators of international crimes because Criminologists oftentimes argue that these are different from perpetrators of ordinary crimes. They are ordinary persons in extraordinary circumstances. What that means is that many theories have been developed to argue that any person, actually, given the right circumstances, can become a perpetrator of international crimes. So me, you, you, if the circumstances are right, then we each end up committing these terrible atrocities. I'm not sure whether I agree with these theories, but this is like the mainstream criminological uh, reasoning nowadays. And what that has to do with is that people are social animals. And since these crimes are often committed by groups, conformity is the main explanatory factor, especially for the rank and file soldiers. So the food soldiers often act according to conformity. They just do whatever people around them do. So they are not deviant individuals, they just act actually socially. And the reasoning goes that in the period of mass atrocities, actually, the norms prohibiting violence against certain groups, mainly, are put upside down, and the violence against certain individuals is justified, even required. And people just follow these social norms. We are social animals. And of course, not all perpetrators are the same and there are many different, different types of perpetrators. But generally, leaders, which are often political leaders, oftentimes military leaders, commit crimes of powerful. They use their power to actually commit violence, terrible violence against civilians often. And followers commit crimes of obedience. They just obey orders. They just want to please their authorities. They do what is required from them. Of course, I'm generalizing, but this is how, how theories of perpetrators of international crimes go. And I think that if you think about it, this also has repercussions for criminal law and repression of crimes. Because does it make someone less culpable or even excusable when he or she follows orders? These are the questions which need to be think about when we talk about international crimes. What is also important is to um, realize the role, role of ideology. So these crimes are often committed in pursuance of higher or noble aims. Oftentimes, there are some higher ideological goals which seem to justify the crimes. We want to defend our country. We want to revenge. We want to reach egalitarian society. All these goals often sort of seem to justify atrocities. And another thing which is important to realize is the complex reality of international crimes. And what I mean by that is that during periods of mass atrocities, the distinction between victims and perpetrators is often not so clear cut. So these crimes are often historically justified Victims can become perpetrators, perpetrators can become victims, individuals can be both at the same time. So the law which categorizes between offenders and victims might be not very suitable response. At least it's very difficult to describe and uh, explain the reality of international crimes by means of law. And if you think about, for example, child soldiers, they are the ones who are abducted as little children, oftentimes educated in armies or rebel forces when they are really, really young and end up committing huge atrocities, terrible atrocities against others. But are we considering them to be victims or perpetrators or victim perpetrators or complex perpetrators? These things are very, very difficult. And I think that this type of reasoning can be applied to many, many 
international crimes perpetrators. Uh, if anyone is interested uh, in, in perpetrators of international crimes, I edited a book that's like a sh shame f shameless self-promotion. I edited a book on perpetrators of international crimes which just came out with Oxford University Press. So uh, if you are interested, let me know. I can also uh, don't say it to, it's recorded, so I shouldn't say it out loud, but I can, I can send you a PDF, for example. <laughs> because it's really expensive. These academic books are really expensive. So it's just, uh, uh, yeah. And in the edited volume, we have, we have uh, many, many authors discussing different, different uh, sort of aspects of perpetratorship of international crimes. Uh, and finally, uh, the, I think uh, the third sector which makes international crimes different from ordinary crimes are victims. And why? I think that victims of international crimes are particularly powerless. So you also see like a power dynamics and powerlessness of victims in domestic ordinary crimes as well. But I think that here they are structurally powerless because oftentimes they are targeted because they are part of a group based on their identity and for political reasons. They are often faceless, dehumanized, deindividualized and brutalized. And it's also interesting because if you travel around the world to many uh, sort of memorials of mass atrocity crimes, many of these musea and memorials have pictures of victims to give faces against to the individuals who actually were, were victimized. And this one I took last year when I was teaching in Ethiopia. So this is victims of red terror, actually. And I find it very striking. So whenever around the world you go, you see very similar uh, type of memorialization. Uh, another thing which needs to be kept in mind is that uh, international crimes lead to extensive material and immaterial destruction. So not only numbers of victims are overwhelming. If you think about it, for example, in 1994, there was a genocide in Rwanda. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Over one million persons were killed in the course of three months. So that's something totally unimaginable like the numbers which any criminal justice system cannot, cannot deal with. And harmful consequences are long-lasting and multifaceted. So basically, it's not only the bodies, but it's also the identity, way of life, and many other things which uh, are attacked and oftentimes destroyed during the periods of mass atrocities. And what all this entails, this was supposed to be a very short introduction and I'm already like, I think halfway uh, down my lecture. What all this entails is I think that it is very, very hard to identify crimes which are more difficult to prosecute and sentence than international mass atrocity crimes. This is a quote of Guinea Metro, who is a professor at uh, University of Amsterdam and he was also one of the most successful defense lawyer at the ICTY, at the Yugoslav Tribunal. I think that almost all his clients were, were acquitted. And I totally agree with him. And I think that uh, mass atrocity crime posed unique moral, legal, political, but also practical challenges to any criminal justice system. Not only given their scale, but also given the fact that they are often committed by organized groups. And then, for example, if you think about prosecutions, then who is more culpable? Is it the leaders who organize crimes but never make their hands dirty, never pull the trigger? Or is it the foot soldiers who actually obey orders? And all these things which we do not have actually in normal, ordinary crimes are important to, to keep in mind. And another thing I think which makes international crimes very different, and someone mentioned it, mentioned it here, is the political character. They are oftentimes committed during power struggles and after the cause, actually, they are still politically charged. You always have a very big victim's expectations, perpetrator's justification, so it's a very, very volatile environment and in a way, one can never be right. So it's, you can imagine that it's extremely difficult to deliver justice in these circumstances. And when we talk about international criminal justice system, I think there are a couple of pragmatic sort of practical things which also one needs to keep in mind when we try to evaluate what international criminal court and tribunals are doing. First, they are relatively new phenomenon. So 
It has been 25 years since the ICTY was established and compared to the domestic courts which have been operating for hundreds of years, it's still very, very little period of time. Another thing is that international criminal courts and tribunals do not have direct enforcement powers. So there is no police, there is no uh, um, prisons. They rely on the state to actually bring them evidence, allow them to the country, and oftentimes these are the same states which are actually implicated in international crime. So you see that it's almost impossible to actually uh, enforce justice in, in these circumstances. Another thing is that there are limited resources. Some might disagree with it, but uh, for example, the International Criminal Court, and I don't know its budget from the top of my head, but since it has like a potential jurisdiction for the whole world, its budget is very, <laughs> very limited. So it's very difficult actually to uh, um, operate with these limited resources. And finally, and that was mentioned as well, international criminal courts and tribunals uh, um, uh, operate in a pluralistic system. So we don't have international criminal court. Actually, each court has its own statute with its own definitions. A lot of law or sources of law is unwritten. Tri tribunals rely uh, oftentimes on customary international law, and that can oftentimes lead to inconsistencies or inequalities. And those prosecuted by different courts then can be subjected to very different rules. So this is sort of like a very, very practical challenges of international criminal justice system. What is international criminal justice system? So I will just very, very briefly jump over these because I'm sure you are familiar with it. But international criminal justice system, I think, evolved in three stages. The first one was after the Second World War, where we have a Nuremberg-Tokyo paradigm which were actually the first international criminal courts and tribunals uh, uh, dealing with uh, Nazi and Japanese war criminals. They tried the elite of uh, both these states and actually despite being subjected to a lot of criticism, these tribunals are still very pivotal for international criminal justice system. Their precedents are still relied upon by modern international criminal courts. Then nothing was happening for 50 years during the period of Cold War and in the 1990s after the fall of Berlin Wall, and I'm sure that you all are familiar with it, the international, uh, the United Nations Security Council actually established the ICTY as the first pioneering international criminal tribunal, followed in 1994 by the ICTR, Tribunal for Rwanda, as a measure to restore peace and stability. So it was basically uh, established as, as, a, as a subsidiary organ of the United Nations Security Council, these two tribunals. And what happens in this period, I think, is that at the beginning, both ICTY and ICTR were struggling with state cooperation. They couldn't get hold of any accused. And what might international community uh, have realized is that maybe it's better to cooperate with the states where the crimes are committed. So there was a trend from these purely international criminal courts to shift to internationalized, which are the courts that are established with the cooperation of the government where crimes were committed. So we have, for example, special court for Sierra Leone, where Charles Taylor was tried, special tribunal for Lebanon or court in Cambodia. And finally, in the 2000s, permanent ICC came into force. So it was established in 1998, in Rome, not established, but the Rome Statute was actually agreed upon in 1998. And in 2002, actually, the court came into being. And the idea is that the ICC represents consensual, universal, global justice. What is also important when we talk about ICC is that there is a particular importance given to domestic courts. So also limits of enforcing criminal justice uh, at the international level were re realized. And now the courts, domestic courts, are meant to be basically the core of the whole system. The court, international criminal court, acts only if domestic courts are unwilling or unable to prosecute international crimes. So these, base, these represent modern international criminal justice system. 
And I have named a couple of these tribunals. Do you know any other? We have Yugoslavia Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal, International Criminal Court. Do you know uh, any other international courts or tribunals? How many were there? What do you think? Seventy, ten, five, fifteen. Fifty. Fifteen. Fifteen. Ah, cool. Yeah. Well, close. There, uh, there were ten actually. What I made, you know, I like to, I like to color. I like tables and color, and so, so I colored a world map. And this is actually the map of international criminal justice. And these are all uh, uh, basically showing where the tribunals are located and which situations have been dealt with in the modern international criminal justice. And there have been 10 of them. And uh, of course, ICTY, ICTR, we all know them. Then there is a special court for Sierra Leone, which dealt with the civil war in C Sierra Leone in Africa. Uh, uh, which is orange here. Uh, then uh, we have um, ECCC, so-called, which is a court in Cambodia, which was established to deal with crimes committed during the Khmer Rouge regime, Khmer Rouge regime in 1970s, the red dot in Southeast Asia. Then we have a special tribunal for Lebanon, which is a very peculiar institution located in The Hague, and it deals with one terrorist attack committed in 2005 against Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. They uh, are holding trials. I think they have been active for, uh, I don't know how many years, but the trials are in absentia, so they don't have defendants. There is basically trials going on without defendants, and if defendants are ever arrested, then the trials will start all over again. I find this like a very, very peculiar international criminal court or institution. Then we have uh, extraordinary African chambers. I'm not sure whether you heard about these, but they uh, were established in Senegal. It's an ad hoc tribunal which tried Hissein Habre, who was a dictator in uh, um, uh, Chad. And he was convicted in 2016, this is him, he was convicted in 2016 uh, for, for many, many offenses and actually sentenced to life. Then we have uh, Kosovo Extraordinary Chambers. I don't think I need to uh, explain these. It's like the most recent international, internationalized criminal court. Also very peculiar institution. I think that in The Hague there is a rumor that this tribunal was established in order to give jobs to many people who actually are uh, not out of jobs at the ICTY and ICTR, because so far I think it has been around for two years and there are no indictments or anything. Then we have a special criminal court in Central African Republic, also very recent institution, internationalized court, which is supposed to address civil war, which is going on in Central African Republic. Uh, then we have a special panels in Didi, which is East Timor Tribunal, which uh, uh, was supposed to deal with uh, violence committed in East Timor in 1999. And finally, we have the ICC, so International Criminal Court, which is located in The Hague and deals with situations now mainly in Africa. So the blue countries are the situations which are dealt with by, by uh, International Criminal Court. There is one exception, one non-African situation is Georgia. So the ICC opened investigations in Georgia as well. And I think that all these institutions actually are forming what we can call international criminal justice. And although they look like a normal domestic court, you know, they have defendants and they have uh, prosecutors and judges, I think that they are to be distinguished from ordinary domestic courts. And what distinguishes them is the specific context in which they operate. Because they operate on the supranational level and they aspire to deliver universal global justice, which actually should transcend cultures, borders, and politics. They are often actually mandated not only to punish individuals, but also be agents of change and inspire to transform individuals, communities, and societies. So in contrast to domestic criminal justice systems, the ambitions of international criminal justice are actually very noble, very big, 
large, and they go beyond repressing or preventing criminality. And these different ambitions or aspirations are actually very, very huge. And they can be divided in six groups, I think. First is to establish accountability by punishing perpetrators through fair trials. That one is pretty straightforward, and I think that it's the most comparable one to our normal domestic criminal courts. Secondly, there is the uncovering of facts, so establishing truth or even writing history so that the crimes can no longer be denied. Third, they want to deliver service to victims by giving them justice and engaging them in the process, give them a voice. Fourth, they want to promote peace, rule of law and democracies. And finally, the argument goes that by dispensing justice and finding the truth, they aspire to bring back together perpetrators and victims and have them reconciled. But not only that, they want to reconcile whole societies. So you can imagine that this is almost mission impossible for any institution to achieve all that. And what did I do? I actually looked up all empirical scholarship, so social scientists who look at these different aspirations empirical lawyers, and looked at how realities actually look like. What actually did the tribunals achieve, given all these aspirations? So when, when it comes to establishing accountability, so this is like the basic table of the main international criminal courts and tribunals. Not all of them are there. Uh, showing you number of convicted and acquitted individuals. So actually the most people were tried and convicted at the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, uh, followed by ICTR. Then we have a special court for Sierra Leone where nine people were tried and actually all of them were convicted. ECCC, Cambodian Tribunal, three, three convicted. And at the International Criminal Court, this one is sort of falling behind because the conviction rates are pretty high at, international criminal, at, inter, at other international criminal tribunals. Three people were convicted to acquit it. And majority, or not majority, but you know, the international criminal courts and tribunals are meant to prosecute those most responsible. So like high-ranking politicians, presidents, army generals. But the majority of these people actually are oftentimes either middle ranking, so sort of the ones who, who uh, enforce the policies that are decided at the top, or oftentimes actually rank and file soldiers. And in order to give some faces to this, this is actually a gallery of some of the international defendants. Do you know any? I, I like uh, on purpose. I, I, I picked the no, not the most notorious ones. I think, <coughs> but at least one. Can you can you identify one? No. So some of them are actually from the tribunal uh, for former Yugoslavia. So Biljana Plavšić, who was the, who was uh, the the member of the Bosnian Serb presidency during during the war. Esat Lanjo here, who was a guard at one of the Bosniak camp with, uh, where their uh, Serbians were actually, actually uh, tortured. So he, he was convicted for, for uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and for 15 years. And then um, Jadran Koperlic, who was actually a Croat, the last judgment, uh, last judgment uh, he was the prime minister of Herceg Bosna and last judgment of the ICTY actually uh, related to, 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 to his crimes. And the other ones are uh, from the other tribunals. So actually this one, this is also a little bit peculiar figure. It was a radio moderator, George Rugiu, who was convicted as the only white person at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. He was moderator of a radio during uh, the Rwandan genocide and was convicted for incitement of genocide. And what I always find very, very interesting are actually women, because women oftentimes are not considered to be a typical, typical perpetrator of international crimes. There are not so many women in military organization or armies, but at least two women actually ended up at International Criminal Court and Tribunal. The first one is Biljana Plavšić, 
who actually was, who pleaded guilty. She was one of the first, actually, Serbian officials who came forward, pleaded guilty, and he, he got, uh, she got um, 10 years in prison. And uh, the second one, this one is Pauline Nii Rimas Masuhutuko. It's a Rwandan name, it's terrible. I never, never can pronounce it. And she was a minister of education during the Rwandan genocide. And she was also tried at the ICTR uh, in the last trial. And what is also interesting about her, she got 43 years. Now she is currently in prison. She was tried with her son. So it was, it was a trial where, where mother and son actually were facing, facing justice together. So these are some of the faces of the defendants at the International Criminal Court and Tribunals. And what comes with the accountability is, of course, punishment or sentencing. And I will uh, give you just only very basic, basic statistics, but you would expect that the most serious crimes of international concerns come with the most severe punishments. But unfortunately, that's not the case very much. So what international criminal courts and tribunals can do is they cannot hand out death penalty. So there is no death penalty possibility. The maximum sentence is life imprisonment, and life pr imprisonment in practice is actually very, very rare. So this chart shows the prevalence of life imprisonment, and what you can see, the blue color is the maximum life imprisonment, the green or yellowish, it seems here, is the determinant, so years in prison. And the only court which sentenced all its defendants to life is the court in Cambodia. All three actually were convicted to life. Then it's followed by the ICTR, where 17 people were convicted to life imprisonment, and ICTY, five persons actually faced life imprisonment. The rest of the tribunals actually gave out only a particular number of years, so no maximum sentence. And what these determinate sentences are, they are also not very, very uh, severe. So if you think about it, I don't know how it is in Serbia, actually. I am not very familiar with the Serbian uh, penal code. But, for example, in the US, oftentimes what happens is that when a person commits a single murder, he or she is convicted for multiple life sentences or very, very, very long, long times. At the tribunals, the average sentences are actually very minimal, I would say. So at the ICTY, the average sentence is 15 years. At the ICTR, 25 years. At the Special Court for Sierra Leone, in this sense, this one was the most punitive. It's 38 years. That's the court which tried Charles Taylor. And the International Criminal Court legs behind, and the average so far is 11.6 years. So as you can see, the sentences are actually not, not very severe. And then what one needs to realize also is that the majority of people who are actually convicted at uh, any of the tribunals are oftentimes released after serving two thirds of their sentences. So in practice, actually the sentences get even, even lower. And what is also interesting, I think, to think about when we talk about accountability and criminals is that oftentimes the people or defendants or convicts at international level who are seen as criminals by the international community or at least by the judges who represent international community are considered war heroes in the countries where they go back. And there are several examples of that. We have, for example, Momchil Krajishnik who came back to, to uh, Republika Srpska after, after being released at the ICTY and welcomed by, by crowds on, uh, on a square. But the similar thing actually happens, for example, in Special Court for Sierra Leone, where two defendants were also released from prison and then welcomed in their villages as war heroes. And this is the final picture. This is uh, Nasser Oric, who was like the leader of, of uh, uh, Bosniaks, not leader. He was, he was one of the commanders of, of, of Bosniaks. And actually this, this one is sort of, it doesn't belong there because he was not convicted, but he was tried at the ICTY, in the end acquitted, then tried again in Bosnia, in Sarajevo, again acquitted. But the reaction was very similar. So sort of many, many people came forward saying he's our war hero, he is not a criminal. So you see that, that this sort of like uh, 
criminal, war hero, celebrity. There is, there is sort of like a very, very much tension. And what it relates to is, uh, I think, the political and ideologically charged character in the aftermath of international crimes as well. Uh, so this is just like the basic, basic figures of establishing accountability. And what one needs to realize is that there are fundamental challenges, actually, which comes with holding individuals accountable at the international level. And what these are, first, the tribunals are politically dependent. I don't think that it's a surprise for any of you, but you know, uh, the idea was that these courts would be like supranational super courts which will transcend national politics and will operate on, on, on this like uh, blank shield of, of international community. But what the tribunals and their practice actually demonstrated is that they are politically dependent and they often rely, not often, always rely on cooperation of states and the states are oftentimes not very eager to cooperate with these courts, especially if their former or standing governments are in the in the uh, in focus of, of the tribunal. And here comes sort of like the uh, quote of not sort of it is a quote of Antonio Cassese, who was the first president of the ICTY, who said that international criminal tribunals are like armless and legless giants, which need artificial limbs to act and move. If state authorities fail to carry out their responsibilities. The giant is paralyzed, no matter how determined its efforts. So this political contingency, actually, on state support is very, very important. And here is a picture which I think also sort of uh, shows or illustrates it all. And then there is a tension between like this justice and real politics will always be there, have been there, uh, and will always be there. And here you have international criminal court prosecutor saying, you are charged with evading world justice, how do you plead? And then in this like higher pile, US saying bigger, you know, like the power. You can never go after me because I am the state's world power. So I think this is, this is very, very important and this is one of, the, one of the biggest challenges and also limitations of international criminal justice. And what this means is that the courts are extremely selective. They are selective in the states that end up being looked at at the international criminal justice, they are selected in individuals also which end up in the dock of international criminal trials. And I think that this, this uh, selectivity actually can be very nicely demonstrated at the example of the international criminal court. This is a new <coughs> building of the international criminal court in The Hague. Well, new. I think they moved there like three years ago and it's supposed to uh, represent transparency of international criminal justice. I'm not sure whether we can talk about transparency when we talk about international criminal justice because we oftentimes really don't know how the decisions are made and why these decisions are made. But uh, this, is, uh, this is basically, at least the building is supposed to be, to be uh, transparent. So this is the International Criminal Court and I'm sure you all know what the institution is, but the idea was that it, it was to become like a global criminal court which is permanent and can sort of prosecute crimes committed all around the world. But uh, it is international treaty. So it has jurisdiction only over states which ratify the treaty, over states and their territories or the nationals. So how does actually the ratification look like? You see the green color are the, the, the states which ratified the statute. The red color uh, are the ones which never signed nor ratified. The purple, which is here, are the ones which withdrew. So there, there is actually two states now who originally ratified the statute but recently withdrew because they uh, uh, say that they don't agree with, 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 with International Criminal Court anymore. And yellow are the ones which signed but not ratified the statute. So overall ratification rate of the uh, Rome Statute is 122 countries, which is 63% of all states around the world. Burundi and Philippines recently withdrew. And uh, I think that what is, what is notable at this, and that's also, again, nothing new for you, is that no major powers such as United States, Russia, China, India has ratified the statute. And also some of the most notorious 
nowadays human rights violators are not part of the statute. So for example, Syria, where a very long lasting civil war has been going on, is not part of the statute. And some international relations scholars did some statistical magic to see actually who, what are the states which support the International Criminal Court? What characteristics do they have? And they found out that they are usually established democracies with strong judicial institution, not so strong military power, with no history of human rights abuses. So they are certainly important supporters of international criminal justice, but these are oftentimes not the states where atrocities are committed. So these are not the ones that the court needs for it to operate. So I think that this is the first sort of like a selectivity tunnel. I call it selectivity tunnel of international criminal court. So these are the ones who actually can end up being prosecuted at the international criminal court. From the pool of the countries which ratified the statute, the court of course has a, has a power to decide itself which situations it will prosecute. And as I said, the resources are limited. So the prosecutions are not so often. It doesn't, it doesn't happen that wherever international crimes are committed, the court steps in and goes after, after the situation. But it has sort of like a, um, a discretion to determine which situations to select for prosecutions. And these are the ones in the red where the ICC started investigations. And as you can see, uh, they are all in Africa. They are usually not very powerful states. And uh, uh, not also the ones which we oftentimes read in the news about when it comes to international crimes. So uh, that's another sort of like a layer, layer of selectivity. It's the situations which come to the attention of international criminal uh, court. And final layer of selectivity are the individuals which end up in front of international criminal court. Because within these situations, for example, Congo, Burundi, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, uh, Uganda, the court can decide which individuals actually it will bring to The Hague and prosecute. And so far, do you know how many people actually were convicted? Well, I said it already, so that's a lame question. So far, after 15 years of operation or more, 15 plus years, there were only three individuals which were convicted at the International Criminal Court from three situations, Congo, Central African Republic and Mali and these individuals actually are all representatives of rebels so there are no state leaders there are no the ones which oftentimes are considered to be the most responsible actually usually either await are never indicted and if they are indicted it's oftentimes very very difficult for for the courts to actually lead successful trial. And that's also very uh, nicely shown at the example of Guru Kenyatta and Omar al-Bashir, who both were either sitting, or they, 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 they were sitting presidents actually during, during, during uh, at least Uhuru Kenyatta was the sitting president during, during his trial and actually his case fell apart because during the trial witnesses started to disappear. There was interference with evidence and the prosecution actually slowly but surely lost all its evidence. So the court in the end decided we don't have anything to, to go with, so we have to let you go because there is not enough evidence to hold you accountable. And Omar al-Bashir actually was indicted by the ICC on, upon a referral of United Nations Security Council and he has been evading justice ever since. I think that it's like 10 years his indictment already or something like that, yeah. And he also used sort of international criminal courts to mobilize many African governments and came up with a neo-colonial critic of international criminal court quite successfully, actually. He was two weeks ago, he was deposed. So he is not the president anymore. <coughs> but no one knows whether he will ever be transferred to the international criminal court. But what this shows, actually, is that, that uh, the ones who actually were in mind of the, of the uh, people who de developed international uh, criminal court, like the presidents or powerful <coughs> figures, it's very, very difficult to actually prosecute them in, in practice. And there was no case so far, no successful case so far of any 
prime minister, presidents, or government officials at the International Criminal Court. Okay, so this is how establishing accountability looks like and how difficult and challenging it is. And I think that what is ne uh, important to keep in mind is this selectivity tunnel and the political dependency of international criminal courts and tribunals because these are the main factors which actually, when we talk about international criminal justice, I think we should keep in mind. When it comes to the other aspirations, how am I doing this time? <laughs> I have been talking for one hour. Oh my God, sorry. You see, but th th that shows how excited I am about my topic. So I have like uh, the six other aspirations, which is our each. So do you have until 8 p.m. tonight? No, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, will just, uh, I, I will try to be faster. So when it comes to finding the truth, which is another actually, actually aspirations, uh, I think that one can distinguish between like two types of truths when we talk about criminal trials in general. The first is a judicial truth. So basically to establish very, very easily who did what to whom, when and where. The facts, the facts of the case, forensic truth, which in a way might seem like an easy endeavor. In practice, again, it is very, very challenging. And I think it's challenging also because international crimes, as I talked at the beginning, are very complex. So the complex realities of international crimes are very difficult to be captured by law. And this, for example, victim-perpetrator divide is not so clear-cut. And secondly, it is challenging because international criminal courts often operate, not often, actually always, in cross-cultural settings. So you have foreign judges basically judging crimes in a country they might have never been to don't know history of interrogating witnesses in languages which they don't understand. So what oftentimes happens at the international court routes is that many facts get lost in translation. Not only literally, because everything is translated, oftentimes doubly. So from, for example, Kenya Rwanda to French and then to English. So you can imagine how many sort of nuances get lost but also culturally. So what happens at uh, the courts which deal with African conflicts, for example, is that the witnesses do not think in the same way as we do. So they don't actually, for example, think in time, only about seasons. They have never seen maps. They have never seen photographs. And then you can, very, you, you can imagine how very, very challenging it is actually to establish these facts when witness has never actually saw a map and when he or she is asked to show on the map where the crime happened. So there are often, often misunderstandings between the judges which want particular precision and witnesses who are unable to actually answer the questions of the judges. And what this all leads to is that some of the scholars, Nancy Coombs in particular, actually said that at the international level we have fact finding without facts actually, that many of the conclusions of, of, of the judges are based on inconsistent or nonsensical witness testimonies, and oftentimes the facts that are purportedly established are not there, because the witnesses revoke, say something different, do not understand, and in this sense there is a very, very difficult sort of environment to establish facts when two people cannot communicate, on a cultural level, on a language level. So these are challenges when it comes to judicial fact-finding, but another type of truth that <coughs> international criminal courts and tribunals are to establish is historical truth. And I think that you can imagine as lawyers that lawyers are not after history, right? Trials are there to establish individual accountability of, of a person, even if the person is the president or the leader of the state. Still many historical explanations and facts get lost in the legalese language and legalese focus. So they, what the tribunals do, they establish legally framed histories, which are, however, very, very limited and not contextualized. So for example, in Rwanda, uh, the ICTR prosecuted only Hutu, Hutu who committed genocide. But there were also many atrocities committed by the Tutsi, the other group in Rwanda, but they were never, never prosecuted by the ICTR and historically, actually, there must be, m m m might be some, some connection or factors which sort of explained 
why the genocide happened and what the RPF, which was Rwanda Patriotic Forum, which was a Tutsi rebel, rebel, rebel group, what they did in a way, in one way or another, actually influenced the, the, the behavior of the Hutu as well. But this type of history, the context, the contextual history, the, the reasons why crimes happened are hardly ever addressed by the tribunals. And another thing is that the histories that are established by the tribunals are often contested. So uh, history is socially constructed. It is socially constructed from narratives. And I think that uh, what for example, you can see in, in Bosnia is that there are three histories. Each group has its own history, which sort of uh, um, considers, each group considers itself to be a victim or a hero, and the others to be aggressors or perpetrators. And this doesn't square with the history that is established at the ICTY. So as opposed to histories which are fluid and socially constructed, the legal history is actually final and very rigid and very, very limited. So finding the truth and writing history is not the best function for international criminal courts and, and tribunals. Another one, another aspiration is providing justice to victims. And this is actually considered to be like one of the main justifications for international criminal courts and tribunals. And I think that here, what we can see, uh, we have basically two types of victims. The first are victim witnesses or the ones that participate in trials. And in this brief history of international criminal justice, there were thousands of victims witnesses which actually appeared in the courtroom. And at the beginning, the idea was that sharing their stories would be a cathartic experience, that they would share their stories and that it would help them in their individual healing. What the practice has shown is that it's not the case oftentimes. It is a very, very complex, experience. Some victims, of course, are positive about their, their witnessing experience. Some, some victims are secondarily traumatized. Uh, so in this sense, it is actually very much, uh, very much uh, dependent on the context, on the way how they are treating. But we cannot say conclusively that, that sharing their stories in an adversarial courtroom is of any benefit to victims. It really depends on the individual and it also depends on the so society where the victims is coming, uh, coming, coming back from. Another group of victims are victimized communities. So the International Criminal Court not only targets the witnesses which testify in the, in the courtroom, but they are to deliver justice for the whole groups, the whole communities. And here, actually, when you look at the empirical studies, you also see a lot of disappointment. So it is first, it is not clear that individual criminal accountability is actually a priority for the victims. In many countries, such as Congo or Uganda, victims are much more after reparations, security, health. And individual accountability of a select individuals is actually not on their mind so much. Another thing which is very important to realize is that International criminal courts and tribunals are very distant, oftentimes, for, from, from, from uh, victimized communities. Not only physically distant, so they operate in The Hague, dealing with conflicts in the former Yugoslavia or Africa, but also culturally distant. Because maybe the idea of justice that the courts and tribunals are dispensing is oftentimes very different from the ideas of justice at African societies or any other societies. And finally, I think the justice which is uh, delivered by the uh, court is oftentimes contested, so the same like history, and it is oftentimes politicized. So there have been some experiments conducted in Croatia where actually the social scientists sort of uh, manipulated the ethnic group of a perpetrator or defendant. And what came out as, uh, and asked uh, its participants to actually uh, evaluate the quality of justice delivered. And what came out of these experiments is that actually the ethnic background of the defendant is actually the most significant predictor of, of satisfaction or dissatisfaction of justice. So you see that there is always this, and it comes back to what I said at the beginning, is that this political group-based character of international crimes sort of continues, continues in the aftermath, and the aftermath is always very politically charged, sort of within this us versus them 
narrative. The fifth, the fourth and fifth aspiration, I shall lump them together. It means that we will be done faster. <laughs> it's pro promoting, uh, preventing crimes, promoting peace, democracy and rule of law. So these are huge, right, if you think about it. What court can actually actually promote democracy and rule of law, especially if it is located away from the society where uh, uh, the crimes uh, were committed and given everything what I have said uh, by now. What the empirical scholars, and you have a lot of international relations scholars who did some sort of like a very sophisticated statistical modeling, trying to sort of uh, model these different outcomes around the globe, what they found out is actually and is very mixed. So there are no, no clear results. But what, what, what sort of like a general conclusion from these studies can be that we can be sort of cautiously optimistic. However, I think similar to what I said when it comes to state support of international criminal court, and these studies are mainly done on international criminal court, is that the court preaches to its own choirs. So the positive outcome that in specific context, the ICC ratification improves human rights, facilitates peace, reduces atrocities, or can boost prosecution of human rights uh, violat uh, violators, are usually in the countries where the rule of law is already established, or when states are already committed to basically end conflict, for example. So in this sense, these are the ones who, even without the ICC involvement, would have followed that path. In other contexts, and these are usually the troublemakers, it does not affect the human rights record, it hinders peaceful resolution of conflict, does not prevent civil wars, and prolongs dictatorial regimes. And I have a lot of notes here, uh, really sort of pinpointing what, what the differences and details are. If anyone is interested, just shoot me an email. I can, I can sh sh share it with you. But these are usually the ones which we are the most concerned about. And finally, there were some studies which actually said that the ICC indictments and other actions can alternately prevent, exacerbate, or have no impact on atrocities in the same situation over time. So actually the effect of the ICC changes, changes in the same situation and it depends on the actors which are targeted by the court, it depends on the political context which is ever changing and it also depends on what the ICC does. So the results of these studies are actually extremely inconclusive and much more research, uh, research is needed to see whether, because if you look at it, this is all sort of deterrence. Can we deter international crimes? Much more research is needed in order to establish any, any conclusive results. And the final aspiration, which is uh, promoting reconciliation, I think that one is the most difficult to measure empirically, but also the most difficult to theoretically conceptualize or think of. Because what is reconciliation? It is a very elusive concept. <coughs> it can sort of be uh, thought of as a thin reconciliation, which is absence of violence. And then we go back to the studies which I just described, pre preventing crimes or violence. But we can also talk about quick reconciliation, which means that the groups or individuals will become friends again. They will cooperate. They will sort of forget everything, move on, shake hands, and have a coffee together. But the question, and I think that what is also uh, important, is that I think that reconciliation sort of stems from a wishful thinking of transitional justice industry and NGOs. And it is a religious concept, very difficult in practice to, to materialize and think about, especially in post-conflict societies and group-based conflicts. And if you think about it, can accountability of selected few in a distant court ever bring anything close to reconciliation? And I think that I will leave you with, with, with that. I, I think that from your faces I can see that uh, no, and I agree, no. When it comes to empirical research, there was uh, just very little research done, but not surprisingly, I think given everything what I have said, the results are mainly pessimistic. So international criminal courts turn out to be much more divisive than uniting. And reasons for this divisiveness, I think uh, I have discussed some of them. You can think of, of, of many more. 
So, basically, these noble aims and co complex realities of post-atrocity and atrocity context makes it extremely challenging for international criminal courts to operate and deliver on its promises. And now I had a couple of slides where I wanted to talk about accomplishments and challenges, but I think that you can sort of distill the accomplishments and challenges yourself. I think that what is important to realize is that at least we talk about accountability. We talk about accountability of political leaders, which 25 years ago maybe might not have been the case. And the change in discourses and narratives is very, very important as one of the accomplishments of international criminal courts and tribunals. Another one is consolidation of international criminal law. And also many domestic jurisdictions actually followed the stance and started to prosecute their nationals themselves. So I think this justice cascade is one of the most important accomplishments. However, these accomplishments stand sort of contrasted to the challenges, and challenges are immense. And I don't know whether it's my Eastern European uh, sort of upbringing, but I am very pessimistic, very realistic, so I think that the challenges, maybe if I was American I would, I would talk differently, but the challenges overcome the, 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 the accomplishments. And if you think about effectiveness and efficiency, legitimacy and authority, and also just on a very meta level, what is justice after atrocities? Is, is it ever possible to deliver justice after atrocities? Is it actually prosecution? Should we think about something completely different? And all these questions, which I think uh, are necessary, necessary to keep in mind. Uh, and you can also see nowadays International Criminal Court, for those of you who are following it, is struggling a lot. It's struggling a lot to actually keep even its most fervent supporters supporting it. And, uh, but my question would be whether it can ever be not challenging, given the complexities of the crimes, the, given the complexities of the context, and given the difficulties of addressing mass atrocity crimes. Another question can be whether it makes sense to sort of put all the resources in international criminal courts and tribunals, and then end up with what we are having, or maybe think much more creatively about, about different solutions and dif different ways how international crimes can be uh, addressed. Another thing, and this is my final point actually, and I will leave you with, with that, is that what we need to keep in mind is that international criminal justice is still a very young system, right? It is still a baby. 25 years is not so much, so I think that we also need time to uh, sort of let it mature, let it be an adolescent, let it be an adult, and see whether maybe things improve. So with this, I think I will leave you with a big red question mark. What is the future of international criminal justice? Is it bright or maybe not so bright? I think you can all think about it, and you are the, 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 the young generations, which maybe will come with, with much uh, better thought through ideas, also given, given the practice and experience that we have by now. And uh, let's see, maybe, you know, I will meet you in The Hague in a couple of years and <laughs> you, 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 you will be the saviors or destroyers of international criminal justice. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. If you uh, want uh, any papers I mentioned or want to discuss anything or are ever in Amsterdam, The Hague or Utrecht, shoot me an email. Thank you very much.